we're going to review uh, the first half of Unit 2, which is on population. So just like with Unit 1, uh, this is not everything that you could possibly be tested over for population, but it is the big picture ideas. So this review plus reviewing the AMSCO textbook, the AP Daily videos, these kinds of things will all help you to prepare for the AP exam. The big uh, picture things that we're going to talk about for population are the different types of density, the demographic transition model, the epidemiologic transition model, population patterns, population pyramids, Thomas Malthus and Neo-Malthusian, and population policies. These are the big picture ideas. Humany is the portion of Earth's surface with permanent human settlements. And this has expanded to cover most of the world's land area. Today, because of technologies, we are now able to live in parts of the planet that uh, we naturally really shouldn't be able to live uh, and weren't able to live until modern technology. Next up, it's really important that you know the three different types of density. So the first type, arithmetic, is the total number of people divided by total land area. So this is population density. The second is physiological density, which is the number of people supported by a unit area of arable land. So that's total people divided by now just arable or farmland. And then agricultural density is the number of farmers divided by arable land. And this helps to account for economic differences. So you can look at the agricultural density and you can really determine whether it's a developed or less developed country just based on that because uh, less developed countries are gonna have much higher agricultural densities, a lot of farmers, um, whereas less de I mean, more developed countries like the US have very, very few. We have a very low agricultural density. Showing just that, you can see that the least developed uh, places are gonna have the highest number of farmers and the more developed a place is, the less farmers it's going to have. All right, J-curves versus S-curve. A J-curve on a graph is showing us exponential growth. So this is really kind of what we've looked like since the Industrial Revolution. We've been in this J-curve of exponential population growth. What uh, demographers are hoping happens by the end of this century is an S-curve. So we're hoping that we're going to level out at around 11 billion by the end of the century, which would create this S curve that you see over here on the right. Most important things from Unit 2 is the demographic transition model. Before we get into that, though, we need to make sure we understand some crucial vocabulary. So CBR, or crude birth rate, is the total number of live births in a year for every thousand people. The crude death rate is the total number of deaths in a year for every thousand people. The natural increase rate or rate of natural increase is the percentage by which a population grows in a year. So a lot of students get confused when they see NIR and it looks like it's a small number, it's 1%. But 1% growth when you're talking about billions of people is actually a lot. So uh, make sure you understand that about NIR. And then doubling time is the number of years needed to double the population. And remember that's known as the rule of 70. 70 divided by NIR gives you the doubling time. And then total fertility rate or TFR is the average number of children a woman will have in her childbearing years. Really important that you know how to read the difference between TFR and CBR because they're very different in terms of what that number tells you. If you have a crude birth rate of eight, that means it's really low. There's only eight births per thousand people. But if you have a TFR of eight, that's really high. It means the average woman is having eight children. Um, so make sure you understand how to read these types of demographics. The actual demographic transition model as it originally stood. Originally, it was just four stages. And stage one, we see very high birth rates. We also see high death rates, which means population wasn't growing very much, which is this black line down here on the graph. Population staying basically the same. Women have six children. Four of them die. Those two that live replace the parents. Population basically stays the same. However, in stage two, we're going to see a change happen. Birth rates are still high, so women are still having six kids, but now all of a sudden, most of those kids are going to survive. So it's a decrease in death rate. 
states. This originally started because of the Industrial Revolution. So for developed countries, they moved into stage two because of the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s. For less developed countries, it was because of the medical revolution in the 1900s, when developed countries basically gave technology like vaccines to less developed countries and saw that those death rates come down. This is when population is going to be growing the fastest. So stage two is a rapid population growth. Stage three, we start to see birth rates come down. They're not as low as death rates, so there's still growth happening. Population is still growing, but the growth rate has slowed. Um, the reason why birth rates start to come down in stage three is because women start to become educated, have access to contraceptives, which allows those birth rates to come down. Then in stage four, we see both low uh, birth rates and death rates. And so population, again, is not going to change very much in stage four. However, your total population is going to be high by stage four because you've already gone through stages two and three of the uh, demographic transition. And then there's also stage five, which some countries we know have entered into, like Japan. And that is when birth rates drop below death rates. So women are having less than two children, not enough to replace them. And so population starts to actually decline. This map shows us uh, the crude birth rates. And you can see that crude birth rates are the highest in the least developed countries. And they're the lowest in um, usually the most developed countries. Um, so again, just take a look at this map to kind of compare that map of life expectancy and life expectancy is the average number of years a newborn infant can expect to live at current mortality levels. So same thing we see uh, kind of a similar pattern that uh, in the least developed countries they're going to have the lowest life expectancies uh, and in the most developed countries they're going to have the highest life expectancy. So here is a graph that shows natural increase rates. Um, and what we see is that even though natural increase rates percentage-wise have been coming down, we still see a population growth being very high. And that's because of a, a phenomenon we call demographic momentum. So uh, demographic momentum shows us that even though there's less uh, percentage growth, because there's more women giving birth now, we still see lots and lots of people actually added to the population. So for example, let's take India versus Mali. Right? The average woman in India has around less than three kids, a little less than three kids. The average woman in Mali has eight kids. But who is actually adding more people to the population, India or Mali? The answer is India, because there's a whole lot more women having three kids in India than there are women having eight kids in Mali. So again, that explains kind of that concept of demographic moment. Another really important uh, thing you need to know from Unit 2 is the epidemiologic transition model. And this goes hand in hand with the demographic transition model, but it's about disease. So this says that there's different types of diseases that affect different countries depending on where they are in the demographic transition. So when countries were in stage one, and remember there are no countries still in stage one, but when countries were, they were affected by pestilence and famine. That would be things like the Black Plague that wiped out a third of Europe's population when they were in stage one. Uh, stage two, we're going to see infectious and parasitic diseases. This is going to be things like cholera and malaria. Then in stage three, we're going to start to see degenerative and man-made diseases. The reason why we are going to see less of those parasitic and infectious diseases is because we're going to have more and more medical technology. But we're also going to live longer, which is why we're going to see those degenerative and man-made diseases. So more things like cancer and heart disease. And then by stage four, it's really a continuation of stage three. So delayed, so you get them even later in life because of better medicine. Um, and uh, then in stage five, this is important, we see the re-emergence of infectious and parasitic diseases. So a good example of stage five actually happening would be uh, the coronavirus pandemic, right? The re-emergence of infectious and parasitic diseases uh, in developed countries. 
is a really important map for you guys to make sure you understand. And this is where population is actually located on Earth. So you can see from this map that uh, there are uh, just a few places on Earth where most of the people actually live. The highest population concentration is in East Asia, which includes China, the Koreas, Japan, Taiwan. So that's the biggest population cluster in the world. The second largest is South Asia, which includes India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. The third largest you can see from this map is Europe, right? especially places like Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, the UK. These are very densely populated countries. The fourth largest is actually Southeast Asia, especially the country of Indonesia, especially the island of Java, which is very, very densely populated. Then we see two what are called secondary concentrations. That is here in the U.S. in the Northeast and then also in West Africa. Uh, we see that around the country of Nigeria. The rest of the world is not that populated, as you can see from this map. And uh, there's reasons why these are the places where we live. And the main reason is agriculture. These are going to be the places where agriculture uh, allows for large populations. Population pyramids are another very important thing from Unit 2 for you to make sure you understand. So these are charts that show the percentages of each age group in a total population and then also split by gender. For poor countries, the chart is going to look like an actual pyramid shape. So this is what stage 2 is going to actually look like. So the reason why we see this is that each generation is getting larger and larger because their population is growing rapidly. That's what stage two shows us. So first, uh, you determine if the population is measuring in millions of people or as a percent of the population. Second, so you should ask, what is the question asking you? Is it asking about women, men, total population, a certain age group, several age groups together, or all together? Finally, identify what you can infer from the pyramid. You can infer the level of development. You can also many times see major events in the country's history. For example, war would be represented by several age groups next to each other where there are many more women than men. Also, you can see baby booms. You can see spikes in population growth like you can in the U.S. in the late 40s and 50s. So uh, here we see the different stages of the demographic transition model in relationship to uh, population pyramids. So remember, there's no country still in stage one, but if there was, you would see these concave sides to it because there would be lots of babies born, but many of them would die before reaching adulthood. In stage two, you're going to see a typical pyramid shape. In stage three, it's what I call like a fatter shaped pyramid. The population is still growing, so each new generation at the bottom is still getting larger, but just by a tiny bit. In stage four, you're either going to see a rectangle or kind of this barrel shape because population is now going to basically be staying the same. And then in stage five, you're going to see this inverted pyramid where population is starting to decline. So each new generation is actually getting smaller. The different components of population pyramids. We see the replacement rate, the total fertility rate, at which girls would have an average of exactly one daughter over their lifetime. Dependency ratio, which measures showing the number of dependents, so the people who are too young or too old to work compared to the working age group. You also see the demographic equation, the increase or decrease in the population. Um, and then sex ratio, the amount of males to females in a population. So these are really important graphs because they tell us a ton of information that you need to know about Thomas Malthus. So Thomas Malthus uh, lived in Great Britain in the early 1800s, which as you should know, was during the Industrial Revolution. So he was living in the country that was the very first country to go into the Industrial Revolution and therefore into stage two. So he was seeing rapid population growth for the first time in human history. And uh, needless to say, it freaked him out. Basically, he said population was growing too rapidly to keep up with food supply. And he said that there was going to reach what he called a point of crisis, also known as carrying capacity, where population was going to outgrow the food supply. 
and bad things were going to happen. He called those natural checks, things like famine and war, to bring the population back down. So again, Thomas Malthus's point of crisis is what we call carrying capacity, this maximum population size that the environment can sustain indefinitely given the food, habitat, water, and other necessities available in the environment. Global scale, Thomas Malthus's theory has not come true. We have been able to increase uh, food supply exponentially with population growth through all sorts of new technologies. He would never have dreamed that we'd be able to produce the amount of food that we're able to today. However, there are still people who believe in Malthus's theory. They just think it hasn't happened yet, that we are going to eventually run out of enough resources. And that's another important distinction. Neo-Malthusians or new Malthusians, they worry about more than just food supply. They worry about other resources as well. So Neo-Malthusians would encourage anti-natalist population policies. Remember, anti-natalist means that they're trying to discourage births. Pro-natalist policies are trying to encourage births. So many consider Thomas Malthus and Neo-Malthusians to be too pessimistic, that uh, we are going to be able to increase food supply. And Esther Bosrup is really the main proponent of this kind of more optimistic viewpoint of food supply and population. So that concludes it for, again, just a basic review of uh, population. Make sure you still are looking over your AMSCO and AP Daily videos to get a more in-depth review for the AP exam. Next up, we're going to talk about migration, which is the second half of Unit 2.